For more than 30 years, Seth Godin has been trying to turn on lights, inspire people, and teach them how to level up. He is the founder of Akimbo, home of the Alt MBA. He's published 20 best selling books that have been translated into nearly 40 languages, including Lynchpin, Tribes, The Dip, Purple Cow, and This Is Marketing. He pioneered ethical online direct marketing, now a 30 30- billion dollar a year industry. He's in the Gorilla Marketing Hall of Fame, the Direct Marketing Hall of Fame, and just recently, the plain old No Modifier Marketing Hall of Fame. He writes about the post-industrial revolution, the way ideas spread, marketing, quitting, leadership, and most of all, changing everything. Seth, welcome to Hustle and Grace. It's so good to talk to you. Thank you for having me. It is a delight to have you. I'm going to act like it's normal to have Seth Godin on my podcast. I'm thrilled. I've been a fan for a long, long time. And I'm just so excited about this book. I got to hear you speak at the Digital Summit a couple of days ago, and you talked about all of these ideas that I would love to just like go deeper on. Let's go. So first question, I I was just telling you offline that no surprise, like the pandemic and that period of time sort of changed everything for me. I became a parent during that time and work really changed across the board among like, I mean, the pandemic touched every aspect of life, right? So can you synthesize what happened to work? What happened to workers? Was it a fundamental shift? Oh yeah. I mean, the shift has been going on for 20 years. It's just been accelerating a great deal. And, you know, when you talked in your podcast about having your last W-2 and being out on your own and not going to Monday morning meetings, if it was 1980, that would have made you a pariah, that the idea was you had to have a job. It would be helpful if it was in a famous company and you should stay there a long time, that a life of projects looked bad on your resume and you had to fit in to be part of a cog in the industrial system. And like goldfish who don't realize they're in the water, we have been in this world our whole lives, but industrialism isn't what it used to be. Industrialism is the act of building a system, a factory that makes something over and over again, cheaper and faster. And that ultimately benefits a lot of people. McDonald's is a factory. General Electric is a factory. The people who make most of the things we buy, but we can't get much faster or more efficient at that stuff. And AI has accelerated that. Work from home has accelerated that. So what we're left with are the kinds of people who make podcasts or listen to podcasts thinking about what do we even do for a living? Because if all you do is mediocre copy, I can get an AI to do that cheaper and faster than you. What we do for a living is make decisions. And I know you've covered this before on the podcast, but making decisions is hard and human and important and not ideally suited for a 45 hour week and regular meetings and fitting into the system. And so we're seeing industrialism fade and the people who are stuck in it are being brutalized. And the people who are willing to play by a new set of rules can still have a job, but it's about doing something significant, not just doing what you're told. So Tell us what prompted you to write The Song of Significance, your new book. So I get that some people write books for a living. I do not. Writing a book is exhausting and takes a lot of time and effort to bring to the world. A blog post, a podcast reaches far more people than a book ever will. Hmm. But a book is an artifact. It is a thing that you can hand to somebody else and say, this thing is important. Here it is all in one place. And I was looking at the, during the pandemic, at the brutality of billionaires mistreating their employees, firing them in public. I was looking at the stress that so many people had, the great resignation, quiet quitting, bosses who couldn't understand why people wouldn't obey them. uh, And much of the social trauma caused by false proxies, by the fact that companies and institutions in general judge people by what they look like by uh, where they came from, by their uh, social status, by the number of typos in their resume, none of which have anything to do with whether or not we can contribute to what's being built. And then I learned a lot about bees 
And I tell the story of the bees in the book and the song of increase from Jacqueline Freeman. And I thought about what's tomorrow about? Because we're all going to die. And I think that the pandemic reminded us that that might come sooner than we fear. And uh, we don't get tomorrow over again. Let's not waste it. Let's not figure out how to extract more oil from the ground, burn more stuff and get more crap that we have to put in a storage unit. And instead figure out how to do work that matters with people who care about us. Absolutely. That resonates so deeply. I know that like in your preparation, in your, in your research process, you surveyed something like 10, 10,000 people yeah. about like what, t- t- tell us about what you asked and what you found from. So it's a, such a simple question that almost never comes up. What's the best job you ever had? Now, when you ask people that, most people fondly remember the best job they ever had. Okay, well, what made it the best job you ever had? And I gave people 14 choices, including things that bosses think are important. I got paid a lot. I didn't get fired, right? But I also included things like I got to do work that I was proud of. I accomplished more than I thought I could. People treated me with respect. I was proud of the work. The two things that bosses think we care about were the last of the 14. Everyone, no matter which country, put them last. What made it the best job you ever had was a sense of growth, connection, and humanity. And this is worldwide. People agree that that is what makes something a great job. So if you're going to spend 90,000 hours at work, why wouldn't it be that? And what's keeping it from being that? This isn't about the boss being soft on you and having everyone sit in a circle and sing Kubaya and do less. It's actually about doing more, making commitments and promises and keeping them. And it doesn't matter whether you're a barista or a heart surgeon, the feelings are the same. If you can make a big promise and keep it for someone you care about, it's much more likely your day will go better. Absolutely. So people are tasked with managing other people, right? People are tasked with leading teams. How can leaders build teams and cultures where people say that's the best job I ever had. Like how, how, how do we help people feel empowered and energized and like take ownership? You know, how can we build our, how can all of our small businesses be Zappos? Please, please tell (laughs) us. Well, you fell into one of my favorite traps, which is you use management and leadership in the same sentence interchangeably. There are managers and we need them. Managers make McDonald's work. Managers make sure that airplanes don't crash and that they take off on time. I'm glad we have managers. Managers use power and authority and the org chart to get people to do what they did yesterday, but faster and cheaper. Leaders are totally different. Some managers are leaders, but not all of them. Mm -hmm. Leaders are doing something voluntary. They're saying, I'm going over there. Who wants to come? They engage with people and invite enrollment. They live in the liminal space between here and there. They invent a future. So it is possible to have a small business with five people in it and just manage all day long, right? That's what they do at my plumber's place, right? If I call, they come, they fix the sink, then they leave. That's their job. And at the end of the day, they go home and they don't think about it. That's what they signed up for. So if you're a manager, you should be, very clear who you're hiring and why, right? This is the playbook. This is the checklist. This is how you do a good job. And it's cut and dry. But if you're a leader, you have to be comfortable saying this might not work. You have to be comfortable saying, I will not look for false proxies. I will create a place where we will solve an interesting problem. And when you're running a small business, you got to be very intentional about that or not play. Absolutely. So I'm curious about your own career. I read that you, you you've done a ton of things. Um, you're like one of the first TED speakers like that ever existed. So cool. Um, but you view your career as projects, right? Like, could you unpack that? Like your perspective on your re- resume? Like it hasn't been a series of jobs or a series of businesses you've owned. Can you share a little bit more on your perspective on work for yourself? So I have a very short attention. Oh, look, a puppy, a short attention span. And um, (laughs) 
the world has aligned with that, I think I would have been a real problem in 1963, mm. sitting at a desk and processing memos. What we have built is a world where, well, Karl Marx and Adam Smith, pioneers of economics, agreed about one thing. When the pin making machine came along, it changed the manufacturing of pins. It used to be that a good pin maker could make 100 pins a day at the most. And the pin making machine could make 10,000 pins a day. So they both said, you really want to buy a pin making machine. Owning the machine is where you go. And that led to bosses and it led to people who work on the machine. But what happened when we gave everybody a laptop is now the workers own the means of production. Every person listening to this has access to every tool I do and every tool that the CEO of Google does, that there's no secret tool you can't touch anymore. Right, yeah. So if you have the tool, the job is not to maximize its cranking every single day because someone else can crank faster than you. It's to find an interesting problem and solve it, to build something that people would miss if it were gone. So back in the 80s and early 90s, I saw AOL and CompuServe and the other online services, and I saw a whole bunch of interesting projects. So I invented email marketing because I could, anyone could have, but I was privileged enough and lucky enough to be in a place where I could do something with that. But once I solved that problem, I didn't say, now I'm going to be the email marketing person forever and go build MailChimp and run MailChimp for 30 years and then die. I said, where is there another interesting problem? Because what I'm trying to build is not a brand name, but the benefit of the doubt. I'm trying to leave behind enough projects that were worthwhile that when I go to somebody else and say, I think I see a problem here. Can I help you solve it? They'll look at my history and say, yeah, let's try. And it turns out that's a much more natural way to live. That's the way cavemen lived. That's the way the explorers of legend lived. You don't get to, you know, cross and and be the first white person to see the Mississippi River twice. You only get to do it once. And now we know where the Mississippi River is. We do. So the the idea for me is as long as I don't run out of resources, I get to play again. So I've failed more times than anyone who is listening to this. I am sure of it. And I'm proud of those failures because those enabled me to become the person that I am today. Wow. Amazing. I think there are probably some people listening who are nervous about AI. Mm -hmm. I think there are some people who have played around with chat GPT, have found some ways for it to be helpful to them. And some people are like, I would much prefer to avoid it. I don't think we all have quite an understanding. You're a pioneer. You can see the future. You're like a soothsayer. (laughs) <laughs> what is happening with AI? Can you just tell us what the reality of the situation is, whether we want to hear it or not? Like what, what's going on? Hustle means a lot of different things. The worst kind of hustle is the hustle of stealing someone's attention to uh, get them by using pressure to do something they don't want to do. And internet hustle is a refined form of spam where you're reaching out to people saying, can I do a guest post for you? And then reaching out to this person and then pushing on this thing and doing sort of mediocre work as widely and as for as much as you can, but it's sort of mediocre. So you don't get paid more. You're basically looking for a job without a boss. And all of those people are going to get hammered by AI because AI can write mediocre copy faster and better than you. And AI can write custom spam faster and better than you. That if you need to reach a lot of people to do your practice, you're in trouble. If you have a few people, a smallest viable audience who count on you, your unique ability to solve problems, to do work that they can't easily get from someone else, you're fine. Don't worry about it. But AI is a tool, just like the internet was a tool, just like electricity is a tool. And I can tell you how AI works. I can also tell you how electricity works. It doesn't matter. You just need to know that if you are a carpenter and you only use hand tools, someone down the street with a factory is going to use power tools and make furniture cheaper than you. Well, the same thing's true with AI, that if 
like I've trained 11labs.io in my voice using seven hours of audiobooks. My wife cannot tell it's not me talking. That means that my voiceover, if I'm just going to sound like me, blah, 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 I might as well just have it do it. Which means if I'm going to speak, I better really be me. Yeah. Because the market for average me is now worthless. And the same thing is going to be true of anything where you have carved out what feels like a safe job doing what you did yesterday where you don't have a boss. You're not an entrepreneur, you're a freelancer. And freelancers are defined by their clients. And the only way to move up, not to hire more people. And I know, Hillary, you don't have a lot of people. Do you have anybody on your payroll? Not full-time, no. Yeah. So you're a freelancer and there's nothing wrong with that. I'm a freelancer too. The way you will move up is not by hiring junior versions of Hillary to pretend to be you. You will move up by getting better clients. And the way you get better clients is by doing work that an AI can't possibly do. Absolutely. So for people who are, say, writers, they need to think about strategy. Like we can't just be producing, right? We have to be thinking more deeply about everything, doing the, doing the uniquely human things, right? Yeah. So let's talk about writers. So Isaac Asimov, I am thrilled I got to work with him when I was 25 years old, uh, used to write for science fiction pulp magazines that paid a penny a word. And so when you look at some of the early science fiction stories from the 20s and 30s, they were a little wordier than they should be because they needed the extra 30 cents. He understood that if he kept churning out work for a penny a word, he wasn't really going to be able to support his family. And so he shifted gears to become the one and only Isaac Asimov. And you can read a paragraph of Isaac's work later in his career and know that Isaac wrote it. And so... Yeah, people send me a note and they say, we like your work, will you ghost write a book for us? I'm like, no, I won't because I'm not a writer, I'm Seth. And if you want <laughs> Seth, Seth doesn't charge what you could pay a writer because that's not what you're buying. And so the same thing is true now. It's not a penny a word. AI works for zero a word. Right. That's your competition. So if I can't tell your writing from an AI's writing, you're out of work. That is a problem. Okay, I got to read the like a, a pamphlet version of your upcoming book. When this airs, the book is out. So these lucky listeners can go buy it right now. But me, so far, I haven't gotten to read the whole thing yet. But I did get to read some excerpts. And one was a really interesting differentiation that you made between stress and tension. Would you unpack that? Uh, stress is not a good thing. Stress is leads to trauma. Stress is... I want to be here and I want to flee at the same time. I need this job, but my boss is horrible to me. That's stressful. Tension is good. Tension is what happens when you pull a rubber band back before you shoot it across the room. Nothing changes without tension, the tension of wondering what's next. My friend Gabe did a blog post about this. If I uh, show you, Hillary, two things. In this hand, I have a dollar bill, and in this hand, I'm holding something. You can't see what it is. Which one can I give you? Which would you prefer, the dollar bill or the unknown thing? There's tension, not stress, because you're getting a gift. It's the tension of how good is my gift going to be? Yeah. And the question is, how long should I keep this re before I reveal it to you? Because once I reveal it to you, the tension goes away and life becomes flat again. And so what we seek is the feeling, the human feeling of tension. I'm doing something generous that might not work. I am shipping my work and we'll see what happens. That's a good thing if your basic needs are met. Absolutely. Oh, one other thing that you wrote about that I thought was very interesting. Are you, are you noticing how excited I am about every, every idea coming out of your head? Um, turnover is essential. I love that. And I also felt a little bit like Oh, but sometimes turnover is sad. So explain why we should feel free to embrace turnover at work. So if you're a leader, you need enrollment. If you're a manager, you want people to stay where they are and feel they have no options. They got to suck it up and take whatever you're giving them because you're a manager. But if you're a leader, you only want people on the bus who want to go where you're going. So as a leader, I think you should have everybody keep their resume up to date. You should push everyone to make sure that they're exploring things on LinkedIn. If they got a better job, go, go, because I want you to be here because you want to be here, not because you have no options. And 
when turnover happens, it's so much easier to onboard people now because I say, just go read the last two weeks of Slack. Go catch up on this. It doesn't take six months to learn what we're up to. It takes six hours. Right. So if you're the kind of person that wants to go on this journey with us and I've created the conditions for this to happen, then yeah, turnover. When, when we built the Carbon Almanac together, 300 people in the core original team, we had turnover every single day. But that was fine because we were building it one page at a time. When someone new showed up, all of a sudden Vivek con contributed 18 pages. Boom, 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 boom. And then Vivek got bored and he left. Okay, great. But thanks for the contribution because we were going where you wanted to go and then we weren't. All, no harm, no foul. So there's something powerful about people having full agency to be engaged when this is the thing they're most, most excited about. You actually, even if there's more people in line, you want whoever is most engaged in that moment doing the work. You don't really want someone who just has, you know, all, all the intel of where the business has been for the past 20 years. Yeah. I mean, again, this isn't true for every single business. It's not true for every situation. Lots of old structured businesses are industrial and need managers. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is if you seek to find your full self at work, the significance of the best job you ever had, or you want to hire people who feel that way, you can't also demand it be like a fast food restaurant. You can't have it both ways. So what we see is it doesn't matter whether it's an expensive operation or not. There's a way to build a coffee shop where the baristas feel connected and have agency and are dealing with customers in a way that makes them glad they're there. I am not talking about lowering standards. I'm talking about raising them because we have to relentlessly criticize the work, but we never criticize the worker. We say, this piece of work that you shipped, we can make this better. Let's make it better together. And that's a new standard. That's different than saying you're a bad person. Absolutely. Could you, before we go, I would love to hear just a little bit more about the Carbon Almanac, what it is, and if people want more information where they can go to find it. So uh, about a year and a half ago, I read a book called Ministry for the Future by Kim Stanley Robinson. It's extraordinary. I highly recommend it. It's a science fiction novel. It will change your life. And as I was reading it, I realized I didn't know as much about the climate as I thought I did. And that's why I wasn't blogging about it or talking about it because I didn't want to feel stupid. Well, the oil companies set that up. They don't want us to talk about it. They want us to feel like hypocrites. They invented the term carbon footprint. British Petroleum did. They invented plastic recycling, which doesn't actually work. And I thought I could probably learn enough to write a rant or something about climate, but that wouldn't achieve my purpose, which is to create a foundational text an almanac that we can just look stuff up one page at a time, 10 pages at a time, all footnoted, no point of view, just facts from other people. That's what almanacs are. And I've made almanacs in the past. I know how to do it, but I didn't want to do it myself. So I did not write this, but I created the conditions for it to arrive. And I was a volunteer. I worked on it 10 hours a day for a year. Um, and everyone else was a volunteer. But we finished this 99,000 word book in five months, three days ahead of schedule with no errors. Wow. And you can find it at thecarbonalmanac.org. Um, and it's been translated into multiple languages and won a worldwide design award because we all learned as we were doing it. And what we've said to the reader is you don't have to agree with whatever plan you hear other people have about what we should do about our climate. But you do have to point to footnotes, if you think your footnotes are better than our footnotes, you need to be able to acknowledge when it's rainy outside, it's rainy. They don't care that you want it to be sunny. It's rainy. So here's all of these facts. Here's hundreds of footnotes. If we made a mistake, we will fix it. But I can tell you six months, nine months, how long after the book came out, we don't have any major mistakes because all we did was point to other people's work. And it was six weeks of incredibly depressing, enervating truth finding. And 
a lot of us felt really, really bad. And then hope started to show up because doing something about it is what humans do. It reinvigorated us. So just a really simple example, two stroke leaf blowers, which are a fairly recent invention, are one of the worst mechanical devices ever made in terms of user safety and the things they pump into the air. They create as much carbon impact in an hour as driving a pickup truck from New York to Los Angeles. Think about that for a minute. And so if you stop using a gas leaf blower, I think that'd be great. But the real win is if you can get your town or village to ban gas leaf blowers, because every landscaper can go buy electric ones. It won't take very long. It doesn't cost very much. So let's ban them. How does that happen? It happens because one person like Hillary talks to four friends and they go to one town meeting and then they organize 20 more people and then it's done. If we start doing that, we're actually making a difference. And that's what I'm hoping will happen. Incredible. Seth Godin, thank you so much for being here. This is great. Where can people find you online? I know, but will you please be the one to share? <laughs> Hillary, you are so generous. If you go to Seth's stop blog, there are 8,000 of my free blog posts there. If you go to Seth's stop blog slash book, no, forget I just said that. If you go to Seth's stop blog slash song, you can read all about my new book and see some videos and stuff like that. But I'm not here to sell books. I'm here to make a difference and to teach people. And if you can make a ruckus, wherever you are, whatever you do, then it will be a day well spent. Absolutely.